Welcome to the Parallax Podcast. My name is Thomas Mark. My guest today is Peter Mary. Peter Mary uh, is a lot of things. He is a social innovator, author of books like Evolutionary Leadership. He's a public speaker, a global activist, leader, consultant, trainer, and so much more. Um, the theme or the topics of our conversation centered around volition, volution, evolutionary leadership, uh, will, so to speak. And I hope with that kind of complex and interesting topic, we more than just scratch the surface. I seriously hope uh, you will enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Um, if you do, if you liked it, please consider, you know, supporting Parallax either by, you know, uh, applying to the newsletter or supporting us at Patreon, where you get uh, free episodes of my daily rants with Andrew Sweeney, uh, where we dig into all sorts of current issues and psychological uh, aspects of our being or you know you can just uh, share our videos if you want to support us so um, I hope you have a fantastic day enjoy this conversation and uh, take care so Peter thank you very much for joining this podcast you're um, in Netherlands now you just told me where exactly that's right. Um, I'm in a place called Kulemborg, which has an ecological neighborhood of about 400 households in a city of 25,000 people. And it's a really cool place to live. All the cars have to park on the outside and the houses are nicely designed, you know, with uh, passive solar heating and all sorts of other things. And kids can just run around safely. So, uh, yeah, it's about 15 minutes from Utrecht, which is kind of central Netherlands. Oh, right. Okay. Fantastic. So but before we uh, dive into volition and leadership, I already said it, two topics very dear to my heart. Like, can you, you know, talk a little bit about your background, where you're coming from and why you zoned in on these two themes and topics, so to speak? Yeah, well, it's more like they kind of emerged, is it, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so I'm British originally. Um, and I often say my, my father was a mechanical engineer who joined the Royal Navy and my mother was a, a peace committed Quaker who was trained as a children's nurse. And somehow those two yin and yang sides have kind of formed who I am. So I've so very been, always been very committed to the kind of state of the world since my early 20s. And my mother gave me a copy of Fritz Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, that really kind of unmasks the the myth of the economic system as it were right that's kind of what woke me up and then um from that moment you know a pathway in, involved in different things from uh from teaching english to theater to international youth work doing um kind of simulations and um using interactive theater yeah, uh, yeah. as well and then into more the consulting world and doing organizational development, leadership development with the first book, which was Evolutionary Leadership, which took me then into public speaking, that kind of thing. Um, but really with, a, I guess, trying to understand change, you know, how change works and what's it going to take for us to be able to create the change that's needed um, to transition through these times, really. That's been the focus and it's evolved through different, as one would expect developmentally, through different developmental levels and expressions of those levels. Uh, from more the integral approach that is focused on um, how you connect up all the different parts in an effective way so that they can collaborate to make a difference to the more holistic approach that understands it's all interconnected anyway and what you have to do is create the uh, kind of conditions of consciousness in a way for the for the parts to more naturally self-organize right. and do what they inherently know needs to be done right yeah. I mean, what I find so interesting is because, you know, in, in, in the psychological scenes, let's say, and the, the esoteric spiritual scenes, it's all about love. And sometimes it's about consciousness, but, you know, like volition and will, that's like always like kind of a stepchild, you know, mm -hmm. you know, there's not much um, literature 
about you know what is that you know what is that impetus that motivation like what is it all about and but for myself i always have like this center of gravity i always gravitate towards this kind of description to the world so how do we you know uh, how, how how can we employ agency you know how can we um mm -hmm. uh, steer ourselves in 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 certain directions so so what's your take on Mm. On, on volition in that sense well it's funny <clears throat> because actually the theory is called volution theory with a u oh right it's different okay. to volition but oh, is, right. connect, is connected right um volution comes out of um looking at evolution right and involution right and deciding that they were too linear in the way that they describe reality right and then looking at okay well what are involution and evolution have in common volution right right so what does that mean that actually means spin which is what a torus does if you look at the toroidal shape right right everything spins the galaxy cells the earth everything is spinning right so my sense was it was more accurate to describe the world in terms of volution rather than evolution which was too linear right so that was what all my research was on but the the link to volition which is interesting is that um volition you know points to in a way intention right and a big part of my work more recently has been understanding how our consciousness interacts with the world around us right and as part of that studying the 28 years of research that was carried out at princeton and the princeton engineering anomalies research where they showed that actually human intention um significantly affects statistically significantly affects the randomness of the world around us right um and so and so will or volition is actually part of what triggers the volutionary process right so right. when you've got a unified field that's kind of full of possibility but is essentially static when you inject will or volition into it or intention that's what sets the whole motion in play exactly. into play uh, through which stuff comes into manifestation exactly. that's that was the angle uh, which uh, from my, i was coming from because you talk about uh, intention you know and about you you use that you know word like in bringing at something intention you mm -hmm. know and to to you, you have a say a fixed star or something like an ideal you 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 bring that into tension and you reduce probability you you sacrifice other things right uh for for bringing that into the world and i would say in your words you're part of this uh volution process right yep. yeah yeah that's right exactly it's literally that word intention is it sets something because you've got the present and you've got the possible future right so when you upload an intention into the field and you give it attention which is energy so intention is information that you plant and attention which is comes more from the heart is energy right that charges the intention yeah um then that creates a tension field between present and future right and it's in that creative tension like two poles of a magnet you know that um things are pulled into movement and the whole evolutionary process takes place which moves from you know causal into subtle into gross yeah uh, manifestation yeah have you ever thought because like I, I spent a couple of years um with you know thinking about if you actually could take this thing this will or volition and you know look at it how it manifests in different stages of development because you, you would say if, if, if we talk in terms of spider dynamics mm -hmm. you have like this red completely unreflective you know energy it's like just outbursting while it's more refined say in the orange modernistic way you where you have mm -hmm. like discipline and focus and you know like goals and you know kind of purpose but it, it doesn't really have to do anything with consciousness itself mm -hmm. because it's just you know it's like but then you know you you get into these you know say post-rational or trans-rational realms where you know there's a there's a further refinement of how will or volition is like um manifested you know you have like this way it's like intricately connected you know with you know with consciousness how how it is connected with the cosmos and how you bring you know your own way your own world and you know the world itself like into being mm -hmm. and so there are like different phases of refinement i would say 
through mm -hmm. which will go through development. Is that a sentiment you would <clears throat> agree to? Or? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, when they've researched um, how, what conditions need to be in place for people to effectively influence uh, the information fields, then it's things like uh, lightness and uh, non-attachment to the outcome. Right. Um, a, a more from the heart based. Um, and so it's so that that kind of um, inner state emerges most in the more complex levels of development. So when you hit kind of yellow turquoise or integral and holistic levels, then the key jump from the first tier, the first six levels of development into the next is you uh, release your attachment to your particular worldview. So right. you're able to take perspective, um, which means that if you think about it, if you're attached to something or to a perspective, stuff doesn't flow so easily because you fix things. This is the thing about kind of the rational mind. It fixes things in place. The moment that you let go of those attachments, then information and energy is able to stream right. more effectively. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so, so definitely that um, capacity to be able to influence the probability of something manifesting. Right. Because it's never pure cause and effect at that level. It's not linear. And there are many other factors at play that we can't you know, be aware of. But you are, but you are, so what you're doing is influencing probability, which is what they would talk about from a quantum perspective. You are actually engaging in the quantum realm uh, with your consciousness. And in right. that, that's the realm of probability. Right. It's also the realm of outside of space and time. Right. Okay. So, um, I mean, like, but at the same time, of course, they're like, like, you know, success oriented modernist people who have like this kind of effortless you know way of doing things and then they're just like spectacularly uh successful because as you say they don't unnecessarily attach to that but at the same time it's it's not you know the the their consciousness or their growth of consciousness is not necessarily entangled with it and i think that makes kind of a difference no that with the start well, of postmodernity and integral you and integrate you know the growth of consciousness itself into it yeah i mean in modernity you know people are successful because they know how to play the game well that's what that post that's what that modern system is they know the right. rules and then they play the game successfully right um and with great drive and energy uh, and resources so they're operating very effectively in the physical uh, dimension um but what they generally haven't uh, learned to do is to access the uh, more subtle dimensions um, and part of the part of the issue particularly in the western mindset with that modernist view is that it's um, disconnected from our original experience of interconnectedness right. so before our rational mind evolved in the pre-rational stages when we were more in let's say tribal societies so hunter-gatherer for three million years right we spent in those stages of development we experienced the world intrinsically as interconnected so it wasn't we didn't sit around talking about it it was just our direct embodied experience and then at some point uh what life did is through humanity it enabled this uh, this sense of separate self to emerge so the ability to reflect on self and see distinction between self and other um which you know psychologically we call the emergence of the ego now, in itself, that's a great step, you know, for life because you, you become aware of yourself, which means that you can reflect more and accelerate um, your development. The problem comes <clears throat> when instead of transcending and including the previous stages, we transcend and repress them. Right. So what happened in the West is that we moved, broke out of this kind of great mother uh, experience, let's say, of being just part of the earth and but we somehow weren't able to hold it and wrap it back in which means we transcended and repressed rather than transcended and included right. so we cut off our history of interconnectedness with the earth with each other essentially with the feminine 
which was the yin was the kind of dominant um, place in those stages of development. And it's because we did that, that we've been able to do everything that we have done to ourselves, uh, each other and the planet. Because if we hadn't forgotten that we are the earth and that we are deeply interconnected, then there's no way we could have done what we've done right. because it just wouldn't be part of our way of seeing the world. And yet somehow we, you know, with the burning of the witches was the kind of classic example of how our fear uh, repressed that whole perspective of basically getting direct access to the sacred. Right. Um, and then the fact that, that all of that happened has created a trauma in our collective consciousness. So we keep running away from it. You know, and we run it, run away from our inner worlds because there's too much pain there because of that separation that we created and experienced. So we then try to make up for it by creating all sorts of stuff in the world around us and, uh, and exploiting the planet and other people without actually noticing more deeply in ourselves the pain that that creates. So when you get to the, to the modernist uh, mindset, it's really kind of an unrooted expansionist um a project that is has created all the problems we've got in the world right now because because of this push for unlimited growth but this uh contextlessness to it where right. we kind of forgotten oh we are the earth uh actually we, i have a body and um we are interconnected with each other and whatever i create out there you know affects everything else around us you know that awareness that embodied awareness we buried deep in ourselves right. and so um so that that expression of that um orange value system in spiral dynamics it expressed in the modernist kind of mindset right um is really a distorted expression of the essence of that value system because right. that dynamic is really about being able to continually improve continually move and strive towards betterment right um which in itself is a great thing so the code of that level of development is about increasing improvement um and with together with that self-awareness and the problem is it came in you know around the time that so we when we had that trauma where we cut ourselves off and then the whole industrial revolution came in and we got this massive explosion of development but in a way that was uh, completely unrooted and disconnected right so, um, so part of what, you know, is, is happening, I believe now is, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's increasing attention to this whole question of trauma in our awareness of whether it's Gabo Mate or, or, or uh, Thomas Hubel, or, you know, all sorts of people are now talking right. about trauma and collective trauma. Right. Uh, right. I think that's because as we move into the integral stages, we become aware that there is something in our past that we need to integrate in order to release the energy for us to take the next steps right. in our development. Right. Okay, yeah, so there's so much to unpack that I have just, just to decide which road I take because mm -hmm. it's like, it's all very interesting. No, just, you know, no, with, with what you started, I don't know if you know that um, the, that um, I tried to bring it all together. There's this um, French anthropologist, Claude Lévi-Strauss, mm -hmm. right? And so he he talks about, he, he doesn't obviously have like a integral Wilburian framework, but he has like this idea that, that there are these different spheres that we have, the sociosphere, the, the, the culture, uh, the biosphere, let's say, and the, and the new sphere. He, do, he doesn't use exactly this kind of words, but so his idea is that, you know, the, the, the biosphere and the sociosphere, they were like kind of entangled and interconnected like for a long chunk of our time, right? And so, and so they, untangled themselves and because they were uh, in our prehistoric times they were entangled like magical practices would kind of work so you would like draw some pictograms in the sand for a successful hunt and you would have a successful hunt because those two spheres were like kind of kind of connected but mm. then uh you know there was like this movement which you also have in psychotherapy when you have like these different voices which is like entangled and you, you try to separate them so everybody can express themselves properly. Mm. And so you have like the, the biosphere that has to be separate from the, from the sociosphere and that happened, uh, the completion of it happened basically with modernity where you have like this absurd objective, you know, uh, viewpoint on everything nature, but at the same time, as you say, completely disconnected. 
mm. right? And so, but you have like, and, but then the, the next interesting move is that, you know, consciousness realized that, that also the, the new sphere realized that it is still entangled with, with the sociosphere. And so that happens with postmodernity starting an integral that, you know, there's a disentanglement of, uh, of these two spheres and, and the, the uh, approach or the intent to, you know, bring everything in its right place, you know, so we have, we have like the prehistoric and the, you know, connection to the earth and then, you know, there's the sociosphere, everything is, mm. you know, a social construct, but it is, you know, it's like um, not everything, uh, you know, there's this postmodern sentiment that, you know, speech is consciousness, which is, of course, false you know these are two completely different spheres and so they have to be untangled mm -hmm. and and which which would also be my critique on the you know therapeutic model you know because just you know there's a difference between consciousness and collective storytelling i would say and and to view something as a trauma um would be just you know one filter through which you can look at the vastness and complexity of the human spirit. So, so that would be my take mm -hmm. on all. Yeah, of I mean, things. I think Levi Strauss that definitely that kind of distinction is really useful. And Ken Wilber makes a very useful distinction between two concepts, uh, which is a differentiation and dissociation. Right. And he says so. A differentiation between the biosphere and the so sociosphere is useful. Um, but they, you so you differentiate the two, but you recognize that they're still connected. Right. But when you dissociate, so you split one off from the other, you deny the relationship between them. Right. And that's what happens in, you know, trauma in personal developments so when we have our own journey. Right. And as we move from one stage to the other, you need to differentiate to give you the space to take the next step. But if you, but in healthy development, you would wrap it around again, right. and reintegrate, which is why Ken says transcend and include. If you differ, if you dissociate you split it off and you bury it in your shadow right. right and you deny its existence and that's really unhealthy because you know that piece of you is not now recognized and integrated in your foundations the foundations of your journey and it'll continue sabotaging your development right until you bring the light of consciousness to bear in the shadow again and reintegrate it right so yeah i mean that's i think that's nice language in a way that in terms of uh levi strauss concept exactly what happened the biosphere and the sociosphere became dissociated right right and that's what's created in my opinion all the problems that we have in the world today yeah well yeah 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 dissociated but at the same time i think it was like a necessary you know disentanglement you know you have the like, necessary differentiation yeah, yeah also yes of course but not so, dissociation that's the key difference right 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 and so, so yeah absolutely they need in in, in entangling them you know it, it brings our aware our self-awareness in so the development of the ego or the sense of separate self in itself is a positive development right right because that's the earth or life becoming aware of itself which is you know miraculous development really the problem is when it when it then thinks that that self is separate from everything else around right. it and that is the dissociation as opposed to the differentiation right. so differentiation is great as long as we remember that it's actually all interconnected as well right 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 no 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 it's it's uh no no i, I completely agree i think like the you know, we, we, we tend to look at, you know, modernity as such an evil thing nowadays, you know, and the, the modern consciousness. But I, I think it has like these two sides because like the great modern scientists, you know, like Otto Hahn and, you know, it's like the, the physicist that later created like this, this horrendous weapon of mass destruction. They, they were like kind of uh, nature boys, you know, wandering in the forest and were like very, very well connected and having this enormous mind but created like the, the perfect symbol of being disconnected from from the environment you know and so yeah. that that very interesting um so let's talk a little bit about you know the interconnectedness between uh, volition and volition so mm -hmm. what what can you say about this like what's your take on this how can you can you shine a light on that yeah, I mean, you know, what Volution is suggesting is that, um, <clears throat> like, 
the tension between the present and the possible future uh, is what brings things into movement, right? So that's, uh, and that movement is a kind of breathing in and out, like many of the spiritual traditions actually talk about the universe as the universal breath, as the whole universe breathing. And it's breathing from causal, to use Wilbur's language, causal into subtle into gross, and then back out into subtle and right. causal. And it's an information flow that moves between those domains the whole right. time. Now, um, what intention does is it's that's the human expression in a way for a need that needs to be fulfilled that isn't currently met. So if you think about it from an ecological perspective, it's like there is a niche in the ecology, right? There's a gap in the, in the kind of dynamic balance of an ecological system. There's a gap, a niche. And so what life does is it fills that gap. That gap is a tension. Right? right between where where they are now and where they want things to be and so the kind of evolution suggests that the the way life works is when a tension like that emerges a niche or a gap that life works to manifest something so that that's registered as information in the subtle fields and then the process of creation kicks in you know to bring it into the gross realms mm -hmm. so from the human perspective the way we can work with that consciously is through volition and intention right which is you know okay this is the general you know directionality i want things to go to upload it to feel it that's really important when you work with intention and affirmations it can't just be a head-based thing or let's say the the probability of you manifesting it increases if you can feel it in your body and in your heart more and then uh, you sense, feel, the, imagine that it is already that way and to feel the gratitude for that. So there's a kind of, you connect in a way the head to the heart and to the vision and you've, because what you're really doing is you're then um, bringing the future into the present, right? You're right, feeling yeah. that it is that way now. And then you let go of it. And that's really important. You then release your attachment to it. And you trust that life will do what it needs to do to bring this, you know, intention into manifestation if it's appropriate for the rest of life. Right. Everything at this time. So that's what that's what volition is really kind of triggers the whole evolutionary uh, process of manifestation. That, that sounds awful lot like uh, the English occultist theory about you know magic, you know. Well, it is. I mean, you know, Dean Radin's um, latest book. I made book an interview is... with him too, by the way. Oh, you did? Great. Well, yeah, there you yeah. go. His latest book is Real Magic, right? Right. Where he looks at the science of all of this stuff. Right. And he says this is like the magic, you know, of the old days in the sense that, depending on how you define magic, right? But essentially, if it's contributing to the process of manifestation, so bringing something out of the information fields in, into the uh, gross, Right. Yeah, you could just you could define that as as magic. No, because like what you're saying, uh, it's like you have you know you, you you mentioned one thing: attention, intention, but being you know uh, uh, detached, you know, like in, indifferent about what you. That's basically a, a, a spiritual tenet of every religion and a spiritual true approach to yeah. the world. You know, and you find it in the English traditions you know the english of cold orders as well you know it's just like you know okay so that's you know the the, the proper uh magical practices is, is exactly that you create something you fill it with libido with intention and then you'll just let go and let you, the universe do do the rest yeah exactly i mean you know the most exciting work i found around that was the 28 years of research done at princeton university do you know the princeton engineering anomalies research did you know, do you know about this? No. This is like, <clears throat> there's a, there was a uh, professor there. He was a real rocket scientist, a guy called Bob Yan. And a student came to him <clears throat> with data suggesting that um, when fighter pilots get stressed, they influence the instruments on the dashboard of their, of their oh, fighter really? planes. Yeah. And he was kind of go away, get more data. So the student went away and came back with very, very convincing data. And he was convinced enough to, to actually start to look into it because obviously this is a significant thing. The same would be for spaceships or whatever, you know? So, um, so they then spent 28 years researching how human intention affects otherwise random events in the world around them. 
And they did it primarily with something called a random event generator or a random number generator. Mm -hmm. And basically had a, had a, a what, and what, what a random event generator does, it's like a very fast coin flipper. So it flips ones and zeros really fast. And if it was random, obviously you get 50%. And so they had a readout on the screen where there was a, a flat line was 50%. And then they would try to get people to increase either to have the line move up the screen or down the screen, which would mean that you were either generating more ones or more zeros in this random event generator and showed that you know individuals could do it um when there was no physical connection between them and the machine right um, also if they were on the other side of the planet but also outside of space and time so also outside of time so they could have people do it um from the future as it were and record some they'd record something in the past and then noticed how that had changed after someone had done something in the future right so um and they also okay, were so let me let me let me ask yeah. do you think it's a you know because i i i tend to be more Jungian in that regard and mm -hmm. i always think like okay maybe the universe is like its its structure is like fractal and so it's 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 uh, those uh, synchronicity, synchronicities are more a causal mm -hmm. you know uh, or do you think they are causal because that would be a difference well i don't think yeah well i mean one of the things they found is that it's le it's less linear uh than you think for example when they were doing um precognition or uh, uh what's it called uh, remote perception experiments right which means somebody somewhere is looking at, at a view of something and somebody somewhere else is trying to pick up what that person is looking at okay right. and they they did that outside of time so for example somebody they would the person who was meant to be picking up what the other person was looking at was told their name and that was it and said you know this person's going to be looking at something see if you can pick up what it is and they had that person do that they did this a number of times right before the person had actually looked at the thing they were going to go and look at mm. right and so then the next day the other person would and then the person would go and look at it and then they'd compare what the person looked at with what the person got and there was a hit you know it was kind of overlapping so that skews our whole um idea of linearity in terms of time being linear because how can you know you can't explain it by newtonian physics you have right. to then step into the world of quantum physics so which would be then more a causal which would be more a causal yeah and more, more in linear. The, like a coincidence which you know was created by you know just the setup of the experiment um well was was basically the story would be that the um what they found essentially is in the in the in my conclusions of it anyway are that you've got two dimensions of reality that run in parallel one is the material realm like of everything that we can see around us what wilbur would call the gross realm uh in which in newtonian physics um is true newtonian physics works in the material realm and you have a a, a linear time um and things are you know separated and differentiated and everything else and then you have the subtle fields right which is which is equivalent to quantum in physics terms so if you look at the consciousness studies of how things that work in the subtle fields and you look at how quantum describes it they really overlap so in those realms different a different set of laws apply so Newtonian physics doesn't apply to the subtle realms. You have laws of information, like information where you see everything expressed as information as energy matter, uh, for example. And then when it comes into the gross realm, it's expressed as energy matter in space time. But in the subtle realms, it's just energy matter. And there is not that linearity right. of time and not that separation of space. So and, and at the same time, the subtle realms influence what is going to manifest in the gross realms right of course right. what happens in the gross realms is also echoed in the patterns right. in the in the subtle realms but they are two different sets of laws so um the you know the kind of findings from the from this princeton study are really related to the subtle realms and what happens there um and not so much the gross realms what that when that perspective enables you to do is allow newtonian physics to be true partially 
and uh, the quantum perspective or the consciousness stuff to be true as well, yeah. as long as you kind of differentiate between the two different realms. Right. right. And it's like the way I describe it is if it's all information, then it's like a spectrum, like the light spectrum. You know, you have this kind of bell curve and everybody accepts in the light spectrum that we can only see a piece of it at the middle and that the rest of it is still there, but we can't right, see it. Right. Well, in the same way for information, right? There is information that reaches a certain level of density. And at that point, it clicks into our 3D world, as it were, operates by Newtonian laws and we can see it, as it were. But that spectrum continues out into the subtle realms. Yeah, but there are a different set of laws appear. Right, and yet right. it's all waves, right? It's all information carried on energy waves. And what happens is when it get, comes into the material realm, it locks into what they call standing waves. You know, those experiments you do where you have like, you have lots of waves and then they suddenly peak together and they kind of lock in. And okay. it's standing waves okay, that yeah. give mm -hmm. us the material right. reality that we experience. Right. Um, at, at, in, and in that dimension, in this dimension, um, a different set of laws apply as to when the waves are, are not locked in, as it were. Right. Which, which ex yeah. So that's uh, how I would explain, you know, based on what I've looked at, that's how I would make sense of it. <laughs> so, um, yes, but, you know, where, where does libido, like... Um, life energy? Yeah, yeah you, whatever you want to call it, like life energy, organ, libido. I like libido because mm -hmm. it's from the base chakra. You know, it's like, because my... And it's, it's one of those experiences I, I think everybody can uh, relate to. Like if you have like, a, like an impulse, let's say, whatever it is. So some, somewhat uh, the, the universe, you know, conforms to these, to these things that you, you know, um, you, it forms itself according to, to your life energy, to your organ, to your to your libido you, you meet certain people you know out of the blue you know it's just like it but but some somewhat there's a way that this very gross energy the strongest of our energies like permeating the subtle and maybe even the causal realm in, in, in ways that are always astonishing to me yeah yeah well life energy is is an you know you got to distinguish i think things like um uh, information on the one hand uh orgone or life energy or chi or whatever we want to call it on the on another hand um and then you've got blocked energy and stressed energy and you know the way those different things interact so reich would have said you've got uh oranor, which is stressed right organ. right you've got door which is blocked yes uh, yes yes mm -hmm. right? dead dead uh, mm -hmm. energy essentially so you've got that spectrum and um, for information to come into manifestation, you know, it needs to be charged with organ. You've got to have life energy or libido right. connected to it. So I think that's what, when, you, when you've got um, the information through the mind, attention through the heart, and then charged with organ through the libido, that's what kind of really brings, brings it all into reality. Okay, so you, uh, I have to go back two steps because you, you mentioned like 10 minutes ago, you know, I hope I do get that right. If, if I'm, I'm not going to get this right, you have to correct me. But mm -hmm. you said something in terms of, you know, there's a, a you know, where our uh, attention is directed to and, you know, that there's like yeah. the, the cosmos, the universe has some, you know, you know, void places, I would say like, okay, so that has to be filled. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? niches. Yeah. Niches, yeah, that's, that's the word yeah. you use, no, you niches. And so that that is uh, that begs the question, of course. So, the, how free actually is our will? If if there are natural niches or opening that ha have to mm -hmm. be filled, you know, and so enabling our libido or life energy to go into those places and like like, so how free are we then in our will and in our intentions to do that? What is your well, that's that that's uh, that's what humanity has, right? Is that is the free will? To choose to go there or not yeah right. but i I'm, I'm questioning if if, if uh, do we have that will because you know yeah I, I could perfectly make the case that we don't no i believe we do i believe we have the choice right it's like how many times 
do opportunities come along you know oh i see all sorts of possibilities come along on my path and i'm kind of well actually that's not kind of got my energy so i'm going to let that pass so we i think we get niches kind of pass by us many times and the question is do we feel a fit with that but niche, that's exactly that that's, but that would be exactly my point if you pass the niche then it's not a niche a niche is an actual opening you can connect to right well it might be a niche for somebody else yeah but then you are you're, you're not then we're not free because if we are just if we only can do that and only decide for the niche that is actually there then it's not in our making you know what i'm saying it's well, like because the other things are just possibilities from which we know that these are not really niche that are fitting to me if i'm just looking for the niche that is fitting to me like completely unconscious because we're talking about a very subtle process here you know it's like okay there are many possibilities i could do but this is just a chimera basically because if i see a, a real opening right a real niche mm -hmm. you know it's like i i can't then then i can't say no because i see that that is the fulfillment and then i'm still not free you know what I'm saying? Well, it depends how you define free, right? I mean, you kind of almost behind what you're saying is an assumption that you're completely separate from everything else around you, whereas we co-evolve right. with the ecology of everything else around us, right? And so I think part of what we learn as we evolve consciously, as we learn more about who we are, become more conscious of who we are, we become more conscious of where we can contribute most effectively so right. words, which niche we can fill most effectively or not but we also get i you know we also get sent possibilities as it were and we're kind of mm, no not yet whereas maybe earlier on in our lives we would have jumped at it because we would have tried to please the person you know for more from a shadow side we would have said yes not out of our own integrity right but out of our need to please somebody right. you know? Father, it's, super, it's super hard to talk about these things because they are so subtle and so um you know you know because i you know just for an example i was just talking with a friend about archetypes right mm -hmm. and so um you know we were talking I, I don't know if you're familiar with the weinstein brothers no right you know and so they're like two brothers in you know in the intellectual scene and the one is more you know, we were talking about their archetypes. The one, the older guy is more like the sh sh uh, shaman intellectual and he's all over the place. And the, the younger brother, both like in their fifties, but the younger brother is like, um, he is more the hero archetype. And there's some things, you know, some instances that I, and, and, you know, it's not even sure that he um, does that voluntarily, but he always finds himself in situations where this archetype breaks through and he can act in heroic manner and then he oh you shit you know it's like um but it's like he can't help you know this diamond this this archetype he can't help it because mm -hmm. you know it's like it steers him in, in certain worldly directions and mm -hmm. it's and it's so deep it has nothing to do with ego and mm -hmm. it's nothing to do with you know the an outer arrays of behavior we like to identify with it's just you know he finds himself he sees you know there's some part of him i don't know him but it's like mm -hmm. it looks from the outside because he always finds himself in the situations where he can expose something or where he can be a hero basically and so mm -hmm. there's some this this craving of of the soul archetype whatever you want to call it to find those openings those niches to manifest to you know but this yeah. is a completely this is a completely not only for most people unconscious process but it's like you can't say no in the situations right it's like i don't know i think part i think we are yeah i think we are born with these archetypes as it were you know and it whether it's astrology or whatever it is but yeah we have these personality types and this is you know wilbur would say personality types tend to stick around and then uh, stages change right and different personality types express themselves differently in different stages of development right um <clears throat> and i think as we become more conscious of ourselves we also become more conscious of our archetypes right and so yes there may be moments where we're just blindly driven by them and suddenly realize oh yeah that was you know that wasn't a very conscious decision i took right? right i was just driven by it but the more aware we become i think you get to that moment where you kind of can feel the archetype arise in you right kind of 
oh hello archetype if you've got that awareness right hello archetype there you are again nice to see you right i'm just going to decide whether to follow your advice or not you know right but, but that comes with um yeah with you with maturity essentially right. with, with development where you're able to um uh in a way not be unconsciously driven by parts of yourself but right. able to, doesn't mean you reject them but it means that you notice them yeah and are able to then decide whether to follow it or not and they are give us great strength right i mean so we can yeah man okay here it comes yep boom here we go but you do choose right and that's a bit are you familiar are you familiar with german philosopher peter sloterdijk uh, uh no not no not properly i know his name and i've read a right. couple of things about him once but right I because like he happens. you know it's like when when i was uh, reading up on you like he has also this idea he calls it vertical tension right okay so it's like you have to he, he argues basically that you know human culturalization and and individualization is always about you know bringing you using this form of vertical tension you have like a goal you have like you bring yourself uh uh yeah you align yourself basically and he calls those yeah. ways we do it like un untriple techniques so learning techniques how to like he says we are basically learning animals everything we do is a setup to do it better the next time right and so mm -hmm. it's like we're always on this on this spiral to something that we want to aspire but at the same time he says like 98 percent of all the cognitive machinations of our mind are completely subconscious you know the mm -hmm. way the way how we cons the, the processes by which we construct our own self uh our self -per perception and the perception of the world because you know it's like okay we are we are embedded in all of this you know how, how i view myself now how i view our our conversation how i view you within you know like i i'm not doing this consciously you know it's like mm -hmm. i'm i'm just in this boat you know and i'm trying you know maybe for two percent to steer that into mm -hmm. some some directions and so he says like we, we we use this vertical tensions to orient within ourselves you know to you know to uh bring order to chaos you know mm -hmm. so and yeah i found it very so. very interesting mm -hmm. yeah is yeah. that that what you mean with you know evolutionary leadership um well evolutionary leadership i wrote kind of from a spiral dynamics perspective more out of yellow so more from the kind of integral perspective of understanding the value systems and the dynamics of change and more kind of systems and systemic thinking the evolution perspective comes more out of the holistic or turquoise space so it's where and i think the main difference is i, I once got this definition through which was like so integral <clears throat> attempts to start with the parts and turn them into a whole right holistic starts from the whole and enables the parts to kind of find their way within the context of the whole and that's a big difference right? when you whether you start from the parts or you start from the whole right mm -hmm. right whether you assume partners and then try to stitch it together or whether you assume oneness or interconnectedness and then you and then you have a much lighter touch on right. the parts because you've already assumed they're interconnected so you know they're interconnected and then it's more how do we put the conditions how do we remove any odd and odd or door any stressed or blocked energy from the system so that the organ the life energy can find its way most naturally through the system right, and that's right. what healers do with the body they don't go in and kind of try to fix a little piece of it they know that the body has its own intelligence to heal itself when you get all the shit out of the way basically and you can do that it's the same with collectives you know one in one you know i spent four years doing a vocational training on how to work with the energetic architecture of large-scale systems so organizations pieces of land and a lot of that is just <clears throat> getting the door and order not out of the system the blocks and stresses out of the system making sure it's well grounded and connected to the information fields it needs and then it just does its thing you know so it's whereas in yellow don beck often talks about it as you know i did all the training with don and uh, uh he often talks about engineer it's very an engineering perspective you know you've got to kind of engineer all the pieces together and right. create this meshwork puzzle and everything else whereas the kind of holistic perspective is more you just create in a way the energetic conditions for the system and then it will do it itself right yeah 
which is quite a relief actually it also has a lot less ego involved <laughs> okay so that okay so like how you know in terms of leadership like how what, what does it look like in practice this uh, this this approach you mean yeah 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 okay okay so first there's an assumption which is that everything um with a name and a boundary so name and it's anything that's defined and has a name has the spectrum of information right so has gross subtle causal you know causal gross subtle uh, sorry causal subtle gross yes. uh so it would be like ken says it's like uh, turtles all the way up all the way down so it's so it's holographic and it's all um uh holons parts and holes um that we're used to just working with the uh with the gross the material realm and then we evolved to also work more with what i call the relational realm so things like theory you out of hosting all these practices are really about creating a healthy relational field because we know if we do that then the material tends to manifest uh more effectively but then at the more subtle level you've got the energetic realm so the the world of information carried on energy waves essentially and what this practice does is it you have a number of parameters which include uh, door blocked energy order or stressed energy organ life energy also something called the bovi scale which is really about how much how integrated the um, vision is of the system and its manifestation right um, so how integrated the ideas are with the material world and something which is about the capacity for the system to self-organize so there's a number of parameters and what you can do is you can like i don't know if you've ever been to a psychic but if you go to a psychic you know they'll often ask you to say your name maybe a couple of times maybe your date of birth what they're doing is they're using that as what we would call a resonator to get in touch with your information fields right now <clears throat> if you've got an organization for example or a piece of land you could take a map of the piece of land and you shrink it down to about this size and you put it on a bit of a4 and you draw like a circle around it um because that's like a sound box that contains the information and by contacting by literally just using your hand over it you learn to get in touch with the information field of that system in the same way that the psychic would ask for your name the project has a name and you've also got a, a map or a symbol that helps you to get in touch with it now once you've established that connection you can then ask for information using your data points so how much organ is in the system how much ordinal how much door how grounded is it and you do that by dowsing right so you can What's say dowsing dowsing is using let's say a pendulum so um you know you can have like a nice crystal pendulum or you can just make one out of a nut and bolt doesn't really matter it's nothing to do with the pendulum basically dowsing is um where you ask a question and then you get the answer comes through you so you make an agreement with your body that's what dowsing so with 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 using a pendulum you can say okay body i want if it's yes to go right and if it's no just to keep swinging or i want you to turn right when uh, we hit a certain hit the right number in the scale so for example we might go okay how grounded you connect to the so you go how grounded is this system zero to 100 percent is the scale zero 10 20 30 40 50 one two three okay 53 percent boom that's your data okay that's what you note down so <clears throat> first of all is you do a reading and it's like going to the doctor for a checkup you know um except you have to bound it in time and space so that means you have to have goals that you're going to achieve that they want to achieve in a certain time um so it might be um if it's agricultural it might be more about the produce of the land if it's organizational it might be your organizational performance because when you go to the doctor you know it's one thing to say give me a checkup and it's another thing to say give me a checkup i want to climb mount everest in six months time right then the doctor's got a lot more information and can give you more useful data because you've bounded your request in space and time right you've got a right. goal and you've got a time frame so <clears throat> which sorry but by the yeah. way that is a completely different approach to therapy than you know the postmodern green you know i have a trauma yeah. and then we you know then the, then you develop like this gaze this therapeutic gaze for your own problems and your own personal problems lead to another 
personal problems and suddenly you're like problems of your family and your grandfather and suddenly uh -huh. you're like in trauma of the nation but you know the one thing you don't do you you, you get engulfed you, you get engulfed and the only thing you don't do you, you don't get better you know mm. just you just in into this internal loop of therapy and that was my that is my critique on postmodern therapy but that what you just just described mm. right now that's a perfect way to utilize this kind of filter to do something else because it has because it has directionality so right postmodernism right doesn't have directionality it's exactly. just exactly yes yeah perfect yeah. so you know so then what you do is you you kind of um go okay you've got your system you connect to it energetically and you ask based on where you are now what intervention would best fit right and there are different interventions one can help ground the system one can extract blocked and transform blocked or stressed energy another can have, give a system access to in an information field that it might not already have access to and and <clears throat> let's say let's say nearly always at the beginning it's grounding okay because you can't you can't really give a system anything else until it's at least 40 percent grounded or else it just disappears there's not enough gravity in the system to hold it so um if you're grounding there is a number of symbols that we found over the 30 years that they've been doing this work that help with grounding like the the tzade, for example is a from the hebrew alphabet is a very good symbol for to help a system ground so what you do is you say okay you know grounding okay you want grounding and you're dowsing which of these symbols do you want this one uh, how long do I need to do it for? Five days a week for two minutes each time. Okay. Well, what do you mean doing doing the symbol? So the doing is you've got your bit of paper which has the map of the place on it, right? At the right. center and the name. And then you take your symbol and you put it on top of it and you actually turn it till you feel it click, like a like a like on an old TV system, a uh, antenna. You know, and you feel it clicking, and then you just let the symbol. It's an uh, it's a, uh, it's an arbitrary symbol. What you no, want? No, no, it's not an arbitrary. Symbol. No, no, but no, an arbitrary in that sense that you decide you. Let's let's let go a step back so I understand. So you, you you have you have a thing that you want to change. You want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, with your organization, piece of land, whatever. Yeah. You 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 make a symbol out of it. Uh, put a put a circle on it. You feel what's going on with the uh, with the thing. Uh, yeah, pendulum. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So and you 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 uh, you have like different dimensions, parameters by which to assess the state of your organization, whatever. Yeah. Right. The okay. state of the energetic architecture of the organization. Right. Perfect. And so and then then you think about okay. So uh, what what do I need? Well, you don't think about it. You ask the system what it needs. Okay, but okay. So and, and then it gives you a, a symbol. Yeah. Which so there are different. There are different in kinds of interventions, uh -huh. right? Like grounding, transforming stress to blocked energy, uh, access to other information fields. And then if it says, okay, I need more grounding, you then got to say a couple of different symbols you could use that would increase the grounding. So you then ask the system, which is because the best Sade thing. would be traditionally a symbol for grounding. Or yeah. So what okay. we found, what they found by trial and error over the years, is that Sade is particularly good at grounding. Likewise, what about just as Kabbalah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Likewise, right. calcified wood is also very good for grounding. Having a ground. Yeah, but effect. again, this is like what, what is the book called? Uh, Lieber seven 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 by Alistair Crowley, where he said like oh. you have you have to you know you have to like minerals symbols. And you know they're all aligned, and if you you know magical weapons, whatever, yeah. and then you use those to achieve certain yeah. exactly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly. So um, so then what you do is if it says okay, you know for the next ten days for five days a week I need two minutes a day of the sade, right? And two minutes a day. You for, you, it's, what's important is you create an energy kind of bounded field so that the energy of the system can't spill out into your house because you don't want that so you kind of create a special space right and then you put the paper in there you turn it until you feel it click in you then put the symbol on you turn it till you feel it clicks in and then you just leave them to talk to each other for two minutes and you do that for 10 days over five days a week and what's happening <clears throat> is information is being transferred from the tzade into the system that you're balancing uh -huh. and, uh, so okay so but this clicking thing is that something okay um how do how do i ask this um i mean it has something to do with you 
yeah. opening yourself up to a certain causal realm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so because because of that, it doesn't work. You have to connect it within yourself. Yeah. So, of course, it's your consciousness that right. facilitates mm -hmm. the connection, your right. intention, actually, which connects your what intention. Right. So you're right. right. So you set it up and then you're going, yeah, what's the critical? You know, we call it a critical rotation point. Click clicks in this clicks in and then you just but then you withdraw. You know, you're still holding space but you're not doing the balancing. It's not your energy. And this is really important because a lot of healers, particularly when their ego is involved, are like, oh, I'm the one who has to do the healing, you know, and they get really sick because it drains their energy. Here, all you're doing is you're enabling the symbol to do the healing, and then you step back and you let them talk to each other for a bit. And then after the two minutes, you clear, disconnect it all, clear it all up, come back and do it the next day okay so now i have a questions kind of left field but i think you will understand because i just i just watched the movie inception right and i had this discussion with a friend so you know that movie christopher nolan you know i haven't seen it no inception. Well, well, well the basic idea is just you know um leonardo DiCaprio plays a, a guy um who is an expert in implanting an idea in the deep consciousness of a client okay you know some uh, without him knowing mm -hmm right and so it's it's a fantastic movie and so i i don't know if the question makes sense if you don't make the uh, no no the movie but i i asked myself my friend so is that a moral thing to do well the thing is you you always do it in collaboration with the guardians as we call them of the system so you can't you know one thing they found in the early years when they were balancing forests in eastern europe for example is that they can always bribe guards you know <laughs> <laughs> that's the, you know that's no, the whole no, thing of sacrifices like that's you have <laughs> you have a guardian of a system right which is the person who is ultimately accountable for it right and if they're not involved then you can change the energy for a bit but it just drops back so you actually have to part of this process is yes you're doing this healing at a distance but you are also working coaching the guardian particularly around intention and affirmations around the goals Because otherwise, what happens is you can you can balance the energy, but then if nobody is maintaining it, when you it, leave, it, it just kind of goes yes. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's mm. this, they found this after the first you know number of years of working in the in uh, Eastern Europe with it, and um, no, so you have. Th that's the reason why you use bribes, sacrifices historically uh, to get to yeah right. <laughs> so, but that's I mean that's how it's protected in a way. Is you can't mm. just go in and you know do of course there's a code of ethics around the work and everything as well but you have to actually in, involve the guardian steward and have their permission to be able to do the work right mm. but it is i mean it's i mean you know every project that they've done over the years they've measured the impact if it's an agricultural project you know it's easier to measure it's organizational around performance and things like that and it just works right you know, works and it fits this new understanding of reality right the evolutionary understanding as i would say or when we start to integrate the subtle fields um then you're increasing the probability of this system being able to achieve its goals right yeah okay that's super interesting yeah mm -hmm. well it is and the reason i got into it is because i've always been you know my question has always been how can i make the greatest positive impact with the least possible uh, effort not right. from laziness but from effectiveness right right And uh, when I found this, I was, wow, you know, it's so from a yellow perspective, it's so complex to try to solve all these problems. But if we can just create the energetic conditions for the system to be able to sort itself out, then that's far more effective and yeah. far more likely to succeed because you haven't thought it up yourself. Yeah. You haven't thought up the solution yourself. The system finds the most appropriate solution. Right. Now that it's got access to the information it needs. Well, the, the problem, you know, I mean, I, I perfectly understand what you're saying, but the problem, I, I think, always in, 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 you know, terms like this is, is language. You know, I'm, and I'm talking about in English lang language, but, you know, uh, mm. uh, 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 words and ter ter term terms and, and yeah. ter terminology, because it's like, this is so, this is so hardcore esoteric, <laughs> you know, it's like, but, yeah. but, that, but I do understand, you know, it's not that I, because it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's super far out there, but to uh, make this accessible to say a modernist person, or even like, Like, well, that like, is why that's why I use the Princeton work a lot as reference because it's 28 years of research at Princeton University's engineering department. You know, so this isn't even. But you already used 
you know, with, you know, with a random generator, that's something a modernist person would reject, like, right out of the gate, right? It's well, it depends. Depends. I mean, uh, it is true that Bob Yarn, who was the guy behind the research, right, he quotes an inverted comma scientist coming up to him and saying, look, Bob, even if what you're saying is true, I wouldn't believe it. Right. <laughs> but then there's <laughs> like uh, James like Randi. Right? Yeah, yeah, but then there's James Randi and he, I, I don't know if the offer still stands, you know, of the one million uh, dollars uh, for everybody who can actually show something like a random gem gen generator manipulation through mind you know in a, in, a, in a controlled setup and so of course nobody in 50 years has ever been no, no, they've already shown it right they've already shown it at princeton but the problem is that you that if you if the steward of the experiment doesn't believe in it it doesn't work yeah but that's what i'm saying that's because yeah yeah because <laughs> yeah no why why would a, a hard you know hardcore scientific a uh, rational operating mind believe it because the whole scientific theory and approach is not to believe because that that is what is set out to do you know not to believe in in in, in jesus and god and you know all this mystical things so well, it's what i would call scientism not science because it's 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 some real science is right observing stuff and reviewing revising your models based on what you actually can observe you know scientism is this attachment to you know a purely rational mindset yeah, but it gets difficult when you say you have to believe in, in the no, positive you, know, you, can't say you have to believe no it's got it's again you know it's it's like it's like the adoption curve right of the innovators early adoption, right right when people are ready yeah yeah but it is um i don't know what what's the english word it's like there are so many booby traps in languages yeah you know that you have to you have to like always scan with with whom you can talk about what and like if if even if you find somebody to talk about these things there are like thousands and thousands of booby traps it's like oh shit no uh i lost him here you know yeah. so it's <laughs> super, super hardcore to, and like for 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 your yourself to have like this kind of hygiene of of, mm -hmm. of mental concepts it's like okay so you know maybe i i don't use that concept because it's like um that's not doesn't that, fit doesn't resonate yeah, exactly. Like, you know, Claire Graves, you know, who was the guy behind Spiral Dynamics right. originally, he used to say, because <clears throat> like, how do you work out which value system people are on? Right. He says you send in probes. So you kind of try some things out and then you notice how people respond. And if right. they right. respond well, you keep going, you know, and you know, you've got a good value system match. <laughs> if they kind of don't respond well, you try another value system. Right. It's the same with this stuff. You'd like try it out and you begin to see, no, their eyes are glazing over. Okay. No, let's yeah, leave yeah, it. Yeah. Mm. Something else, yeah. Without mm. any judgment, of course, you know. Well, which is a formative contradiction uh, in, in itself, because you always judge, no? <laughs> <laughs>